Welcome everybody. I'm Kareem Bardisi, the co-founder and executive director of the Ryerson Leadership Lab and one of the partner organizations along with the Brookfield Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship and Matthew Mendelssohn, all situated at Ryerson University, uh, the creators and co-founders of First Policy Response. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining this video town hall. Um, a few uh, uh, matters to begin with. We'll have some introductions, uh, some conversation, and then some breakout rooms and then we'll conclude all, all together uh, before 6.30. Uh, very much appre appreciating people uh, joining us at this late hour um, and also uh, recognizing that uh, participation in these kinds of events is difficult uh, based on the current circumstances we're in and uh, through you uh, pr uh, appreciating those who are not able to participate uh, for various reasons today. Uh, this session is being recorded and will be distributed uh, online later and we would encourage you to share the learnings of this session along with uh, some other um, material related to this event that we'll be sharing uh, a little later on. Before we begin, I'd like to give the land acknowledgement and we do this as a symbolic restorative act, one among many here to follow at Ryerson uh, and as part of the reconciliation project at Ryerson University. Um, uh, where I'm sitting and where Ryerson University sits is on the territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee and the Huron-Wendat is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty, the Williams Treaties, and Treaty 13. Uh, we at First Policy Response are committed to honoring our obligations to these nations, treaties, and to justice for Indigenous peoples more generally. And we, in this project, we hope to do that by amplifying Indigenous voices through the publication of pieces and partnerships with Indigenous organizations and communities, uh, a space where we have some work to do. Uh, one of the ways we are trying to address that is through a contributors fund to support pieces written by underrepresented groups, people in underrepresented groups with a special focus on black and indigenous voices. Uh, and that fund is generally supported by the McConnell Foundation. Um, here at First Policy Response, our goal is to bring together the Canadian public policy community to highlight the best economic and social policy ideas to keep us afloat and together uh, during and after the pandemic. Uh, our focus is on those ideas that can get Canadians through the immediate crisis and prepare us for sustainable and equitable recovery. And we invite many players, uh, not just frontline policy makers and leaders, but people in the private sector, labor, academia, and the not-for-profit sector uh, to join us, uh, to engage with us, and we will do our best to amplify your work. Uh, we aspire to bring together the community of public policy first responders. Uh, this event, I'm very pleased to say, is a partnership event on the future of post-secondary institutions, uh, both colleges and universities um, in Canada. Uh, during and after, uh, during and coming out of the pandemic, and it's organized in partnership with the Walrus Magazine and the Public Policy Forum. Uh, we'll have about 30, 30 minutes of discussion with the panelists, uh, moderated by uh, Jennifer Hollett uh, from the Walrus, um, and then we'll have questions from you via Slido.com. To ask questions, visit Slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and enter code FPR7. Uh, We've done so many events, I'm losing track. Uh, um, and that'll be uh, dropped into the chat later. I'm also very pleased to see uh, and thank you to Sahara Shafiq, who along with Stephanie McClellan is one of the managing editors of uh, First Policy Response, who's encouraging you to introduce yourself um, in the chat box. And uh, it's very good to know which community members we have um, here. I under we understand we have participation uh, from the post-secondary community from across Canada. Um, after the moderated Q&A, um, which again will be uh, helped by the Slido platform, um, we'll have an opportunity to uh, join, uh, you'll have an opportunity to join smaller breakout rooms where you'll be in a room with one of the panelists who can ask questions in a more intimate setting. Um, we're very happy to have uh, Jennifer Hollett, who's a, a, a great friend of uh, the Ryerson Leadership Lab and of Ryerson, um, moderating this discussion and a great friend of the First Policy Response. Uh, Jen is the Executive Director of the Walrus, Canada's Conversation. The Walrus is known for its award-winning independent journalism, fact-checking, uh, uh, commodity that uh, we need more than ever uh, in at this time and which is uh, so integral to the magazine industry and continues to be, uh, and national ideas focused events like this one. Prior to this one, Jennifer was the head of news and government at Twitter Canada and has worked as a journalist with the CBC, CTV and CHUM and has also worked as a trainer for journalists for human rights. Jen, Jen has a master's degree in public admin from the Harvard Kennedy School and a BA with a specialization in journalism and communications from a university that is not Ryerson. Uh, uh, specifically Concordia. Uh, and without further, further ado, I'll pass it over to Jen and she can kick off, she can introduce our panelists and kick off the conversation. 
Thanks, Green. You got to love that universal rivalry. It, it exists no matter where you are, for sure. Really appreciate that kind introduction and welcome to everyone. Glad to see so many introductions in chat and we encourage you to keep that conversation alive throughout. I'd like to welcome to our discussion tonight, Jake Hirsch Allen, a North America Higher Ed and Workforce Development System Lead with LinkedIn. And Jake works with colleges and universities in LinkedIn's Learning Solutions. Also joining us, we have uh, Fazia Issa, Vice President Education and Corporate Office with McMaster's Students Union. And some of her key platform points for this year, online learning, deferred exam policy, financial aid, and anti-discrimination and anti-racism. Uh, also with us tonight, President Mohamed Lashemi, President and Vice Chancellor at Ryerson University. Uh, joined Ryerson back in 1998 as a professor of civil engineering. And uh, the president has many accomplishments, but I just wanna highlight that during his time, he has promoted and established Ryerson as a global university. Uh, and also part of our conversation tonight, Alex Usher, President of Higher Education Strategy Associates. Prior to this work uh, in this organization that he has founded, he was the director of the Educational Policy Institute Canada. Now, I, like many of you, whether you're in phase two or phase three or a different version of that, because I know we have people joining from across North America and, and around the world, uh, as I've been having physically distant walks and, and backyard catch ups, I find everyone is talking about fall. What's happening in fall? And there are more question marks than there are answers. And university and college plans for the fall keep coming up because everyone has someone either in their family that this impacts or a neighbor uh, or, or a friend. So I would like to start with you, Mohammed. How are you and Ryerson heading into the fall? Uh, thank you very much, um, Jennifer and the uh, team for inviting me and uh, Good afternoon, everybody, and I hope that everybody is staying safe and healthy during these challenging times. Um, I would say, uh, uh, to answer your question, in planning for um, the uh, fall semester, which is uh, the near future, um, we continue to embrace the flexibility, uh, creativity, and resilience uh, needed to remain focused on providing um, a comprehensive supporting and fulfilling experience for all our students. Um, we understand the challenges faced by all of our students, but also the challenges faced by our faculty and staff. I think it's important to recognize um, this uh, uh, as a community, we're all uh, facing those challenges. Um, so um, we uh, made the decision that uh, the safety and well-being of our students, faculty and staff would be our first priority. So I think it's very important to be clear about that from the beginning. Uh, and I would say based on that, the majority of our programs will be delivered uh, virtually uh, online in, in the fall. Uh, we have some exceptions. We have some uh, programs mainly in the Faculty of uh, Communication and Design where we will be offering uh, limited on-campus um, experiential opportunities uh, to complement uh, remote activities. And um, those selected uh, experiences will be subject to, of course, safety and health uh, parameters at the time, because we want also to offer flexibility uh, at which time we have to offer those activities. And um, we want to make sure in this case also that students who are not able to participate in those activities have the flexibility also to have a strong virtual alternative. So uh, the message to our students that living in Toronto or coming to campus will not be a requirement for the fall semester, but those who are able to be on campus or those who are living uh, close to, to our campus, we want to offer uh, some flexibility. And to make sure all students feel supported and uh, uh, we are, I mean, for us, it's the success of our uh, students. We have many systems in place to keep students motivated, engaged, and equipped uh, for, the, uh, for the year ahead. Uh, I would probably just give you a, a, a one single example because um, we also have to pay attention to the transition 
uh, students who are coming from high school. We all, I mean, we know from the past that the transition from high school to university is, is a big challenge for, for students. In particular this year, because of the pandemic, uh, that, that challenge is uh, amplified and uh, our uh, uh, student um, affairs uh, division has created an enhanced uh, summer transition program for new students uh, called uh, Get uh, Rise in the Ready. And the focus of it is the development of um, academic skills while also fortunately community engagement and also uh, promoting uh, uh, student well-being. So, I think it's important for us to, uh, to start on kind of a solid foundation. Um, it's going to be a new uh, way of doing it. Uh, the term will be very different uh, from what we expected on what we had in, in the past, but it's important that students continue to feel supported and engaged. And uh, also it's important for our uh, faculty and staff to feel supported because they cannot provide the type of uh, support that is needed from them if they don't feel supported. And we know all the challenges faced by every one of us. Thank you, Mohammed. You brought up all the different people who make up a university and a university community, but it really does come back to the students. So Fazia, I wanna hand it over to you. Just tell us like, what are you hearing from students? Like, how, how are you, how are others feeling? So also thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for moderating this. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Um, in terms of how students are feeling, I think it's complicated. Um, I know a lot of students when they first heard on, the, on McMaster's end, um, going almost fully online, um, kind of what that means for students who have been locked into leases, what that means for first year transition, um, what that means even for things like Welcome Week um, and students not being able to have that in-person transition. I think right now a lot of students are feeling the pressure and the all the things that come with living in a global pandemic, which is worrying about finances, um, worrying about home life, um, how things are going at home, but also worrying about their academics and kind of what that'll look like for the year. Um, I know a lot of students are worried about the cost of tuition. Um, students are, are wondering whether or not they're gonna feel isolated during this first semester. Um, honestly, it, it really doesn't make a difference in terms of not being on campus, not having the kind of breathing room of extracurriculars, um, being able to walk out of lecture with your friends, um, having your entire semester be through a screen can be isolating, um, especially paired with the fact that, you know, they're going to be limited in going outside, um, limited in interaction with friends, um, friends may be out of province or international students. Um, there's just a bit of anxiety there. I think also there's, there's a difference in terms of um, domestic student, international student concerns. Um, of course, like domestic students are going to be facing a lot of barriers, um, regardless of you know, kind of how their home life is. But I think with international students, there's, there's worries of, of privacy issues. What platform is gonna be used for online learning? Um, even if they have access to a VPN, is that going to um, still keep their information safe? Is, is, is their information gonna be monitored at all if they're interacting with courses? Um, so there's a lot to consider. Um, I think on our student union side, you know, we, we're doing everything we can in terms of advocating for ensuring that on the student union side in terms of finances, um, students are saving money in any way that they can. Um, in terms of also having conversations with our university um, to ensure that, you know, that fall semester online isn't going to be a, you know, a fall syllabus, sorry, like a, a syllabus that would have happened prior to, um, wouldn't just be like an in-person syllabus just thrown online. Um, because obviously in that in-person to online transition, there's a lot of things that need to be changed. Um, so just really making sure that, that this fall semester, even though it's online, even though it's going to be through a screen, we'll be engaging um, and that professors are prioritizing, you know, student differential access to Wi-Fi, differential home lives, um, just a lot to consider. Um, so. Yeah, you, you bring up, I think, the tension. I was speaking to someone at uh, a, a university here in Ontario, and he was saying that he hears from a lot of students, are we going to get a discount? Because, like, this is not what we expected. But then he hears from all the professors, are we going to get a raise because we have to do more work. So it's like both has to happen here, which is like, it's not just the same plan. It does have to be adapted and, and designed and really brought to life. But that's all the additional work on top of the other piece that goes in, in, into education. So yeah, you, you've highlighted that piece. I want to bring in uh, Alex. Alex, uh, there are so many different trends and policies and decisions depending where you are in Ontario, where you are in Canada, where you are in, in the world. Can you give us a, a snapshot 
at some of the different paths that universities and colleges are taking in terms of heading back to school. Obviously, McMaster and, and Ryerson going virtual, but that's not the case for all schools. It will be. <laughs> um, really? there are some, there's, some, there's some universities in the United States in particular who have been playing bait and switch with students, pretending they're going to be online or they're going to be in person in the fall because they, they're worried that if they admit they're online, people will leave, they'll run away. And I think in Canada, we had some of those worries about international students at the very beginning. We'll see if those are going to come true. The great thing about Canadian university response so far has very much been um, that nearly all institutions sent pretty clear uh, messages very early on. Anything that can be online will be online because that's the way to be safe and we need to be able to give professors time to plan. We need to be able to give students time to plan. That was the right call, absolutely the right call. Um, where I think you get, I mean, people can make a fetish out of minor differences like, uh, you know, are we going to be, will we have, will we allow 20% of students on, on, on campus or 30%? Will, you know, will we do this with graduates? Can we do something with medicine but not engineering? I mean, there's a lot of that kind of minor stuff that's going on. I think the big decision that most institutions have to face, and it's one that I, it's the one area that worries me about the Canadian response, it's residences. I think it's pretty clear right now that uh, the major spreader events that we're seeing, um, a lot of them involve young people socializing. And I totally get why people want to socialize after six months of this nonsense. Um, but I think over and over again, you see it in the United States. And I think you've seen it in a couple of places in Canada. If you open the residences, you know, I mean, the reason people go to, it's not just the reason people go to residences, the reason people go to university is to be social. Yeah. Right? And, and so if you open the residences, unless you're running them like a combination of a monastery and a, and a minimum security prison, there's going to be a lot of, of uh, space available and time available for socializing. And you've got a real problem because as I think some people have, um, have mentioned at other times, um, the residences have the potential to be like cruise ships on campus. And things can move very quickly. And we've already seen outbreaks at a couple of universities and particularly universities in the U.S. where the fraternities have been, where the fraternities are major sources of, of student housing. I think that could happen in Canada. And I think a lot of universities are being very blithe about um, uh, the, the health hazards posed by the residences. I understand they want to do the right thing. They got people coming from around the country. They want to provide some kind of student life. But that's going to be a tough one. That's, that's going to be the, the flashpoint, I think, for the fall. So what are the choices then when it comes to residents in terms of the conversations that are happening right now? Well, you can try and keep them open and hope for the best. You can integrate some kind of distancing policy, which would allow you to run them at a one half or a one third um, capacity. Although I don't think that really changes the nature of the socialization that is going to occur uh, or you close them. And I mean, even that doesn't totally eliminate because students will find other places off campus to socialize. But I, I think I, I, those are the vectors you have to worry about. And in a sense, the universities have got to give very, very clear messages to students about what kind of socializing is responsible. And I think it's a really big deal in small towns, those, you know, like what they call the Maple League, this, you know, the bishops and St. FX and Acadia, where the university is half the town or more. And those places... Uh, if it gets loose in those places, those towns are, are in real trouble. I mean, I get it, right? I mean, because those school, those, those tall, small towns like Wolfville, they, de they depend on students coming. So they want students to be there. But on the other hand, if some of those students, you know, uh, you know maybe for me, the issue would be uh, probably biggest at bishops. Um, a few kids go into Montreal for uh, a weekend and pick up the disease and come back and go into the residences. You got a problem. It goes right through the community, It'll burn right through that community. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Alex. Now, I love a good meme. Uh, I say that because I think memes can capture a moment. They can give us something to laugh at. Uh, they definitely reflect conversations. So I want to share this meme with you. And, and Jake, I'd like to get your thoughts on, on it. Some of you may have seen this meme or a different version. So I'm going to read it to you. But it looks like this. It's basically all the social platforms so it says annual streaming price, Netflix, $108, Hulu, $72, YouTube Red, $120, Disney Plus, $84, Harvard University, $50,420.
suggesting the joke being that education has just become the next streaming platform. So obviously this captures how some people feel. It also makes the joke at Harvard that it costs too much, which it does. Uh, but Jake, over to you. You know, you work at LinkedIn and LinkedIn has been a leader in online education for a while. I think it's, it's really helped your company break through in a very competitive social media landscape. Uh, but do people value online education? Like where are we at right now with the culture? It's a great question and it's a great meme because it's been echoed many times over the past decade as the onset of online learning led folks in higher ed who were actually thinking about this. And I think at that time it was a very, very small minority to begin to fear for their own positions and their own organizations. But I also think it's particularly true in Canada where on two different occasions at sort of instrumental moments in my career, in my role at LinkedIn Learning, working with post-secondaries because they use it to teach in, in that case, uh, I was accused first of being a neoliberal imposition on the academic freedom of Canada's faculty and staff, and next on being the blockbuster to the, uh, sorry, the Netflix to the blockbuster of Alberta's higher education institutions. So exactly the analogy that you just made uh, in front of a variety of presidents of Alberta's higher education institutions, which as you can imagine, didn't go over particularly well with anybody in the room. And yet, I think the point that folks are making is one that we are only listening to now. Uh, what's amazing is it's taken a pandemic, in many cases, for the Harvards of this world to realize that they can't produce the exact same thing they produced 200, 300 years ago and just keep increasing the price for it. Now, that's not as true in Canada. And I think, you know, it's kudos to Ryerson and Concordia for the fact that when you unbundle them, you actually end up with a lot more value, both in person and online than you would just from the brand and the credential. And yet, I think it is that unbundling that we're now facing as online becomes a significant, maybe unnecessary alternative to the way that most of us went to school. Um, and I'm honestly excited for that. I think it is time now that, that Canada's post-secondaries face a, a, the reality that they honestly have been facing for a decade, but haven't looked at. They've been you know, either ostriches in the sand or whatever analogy you want. And uh, the challenge is that that's gonna impact students poorly. So as much as faculty members will have a hard time, administrators will have a hard time, many of them are tenure track. I honestly worry a lot more about the contract instructors than anybody else on the faculty staff side, um, because they're the ones who are really working overtime and probably not getting paid very much for it without the job security. Um, but it's honestly the students that I worry the most about. And I think Fazia highlighted perfectly both in her platform and in her comments earlier, the challenges that students face, which is to say a university system that for a long time has not been student centered. And in the UK, you know, they've created national institutions to try to get their post-secondaries to stop being so faculty centered or stop being so institution centered and instead actually think about the clients of this institution. Um, and I think now is finally the time when this pandemic may push many to actually change how they teach to be um, much more student centered. Excellent. Thank you, Jake. And I just want to say hello to everyone in, in chat. Thank you for introducing yourself. Please continue to do so. Uh, that's, to me, one of the, the good parts of this. There are silver linings in how we use technology and we're able to connect and learn in different ways. On that note, Fazia, you highlighted like, oh, I want to say like endless challenges that students are, are navigating right now. I'm curious, um, are there any positives or silver linings with some of, of the new technology? You know, we're hearing the word hybrid down the road, right? That there will be this hybrid future. Has there been any positive feedback with some of the, the new tools made available to students? Sure, I think something that's, that we found to be like really beneficial has been that when you move online, there's just an arsenal of tools, resources, information that professors can access. And I, I think that's been true for a long time, but I think that especially moving into um, second semester when um, the winter semester moved online, because I was still a student at that time, um, I found that professors were more willing to use the resources, more willing to move away from, I guess, the textbooks that were in the campus store and the textbook that they have been using for a while, um, more willing to kind of like open up the kind of resources that were online um, and everything that was available. So I think that's something that I've seen that's going to be positive for students in terms of just getting different, a different lens in terms of the way that they actually um, study their courses. Um, I think that's something that's very exciting, even just moving away from um, lengthy readings, moving away from, um, I guess, just consistent essays or testing um, and kind of the more traditional models of 
academia that have, we've seen for many, many years. Um, yeah, so I think that's something that's positive. And just moving from that in-person to online framework, just professors and faculties have had to think outside of the box. Um, I've seen some draft syllabus syllabi um, and seen that there's just been a lot of difference. Um, even in just the week to week, it's no longer just, okay, let's all come and you'll listen to me talk for three hours. There's been like, okay, well, maybe we can have a portion of this um, being this interactive thing that, that I found, or maybe a portion of this can be flipped and you can um, kind of like take on the lecture part outside of the classroom and come in and we can ask questions. Um, so yeah, I think it just, even just, there's something that's really beneficial in even just reevaluating the framework of what a course could look like. Um, so I think that, that that's a positive. Yeah, there has been creativity in all of this. Uh, we've been forced to be creative. And, and that's my question for, for Mohammed. I think we'll all agree, you know, everyone uh, participating tonight, it was really incredible to watch institutions, universities, colleges back in March somehow get themselves online, uh, especially because I'm sure there were many conversations uh, where you know, meetings said it would take years, <laughs> you know, that you have to build the infrastructure. The, I mean, Jake's, Jake's laughing, right? We, we all know it's not limited to academic institutions, uh, but uh, you, you're forced to, you responded, the priority was help. What now is Ryerson navigating and other universities in terms of what you have to do to get it right for the fall? Because that's like what's up ahead, right? Yeah. It's one thing to quickly yeah. adjust and it's another thing to say, okay, now we know we're heading into this. I would say, um, of course, the, the shift to um, remote teaching and learning or online uh, was very quick. And I uh, give credit also to uh, our faculty and uh, instructors who have been um, extremely um, responsive to, uh, to, uh, to the need of doing it. And I can tell you, in our case, uh, we made the decision to uh, shift on to online or uh, remote learning on Friday. It was, uh, if you remember, uh, when the uh, uh, pandemic was declared worldwide uh, on Thursday, uh, Friday the 13th of March, we made that decision. By Monday, faculty were really uh, uh, offering their, their classes in, in a kind of a remote format. So that was the reaction and I would say this is, has been a tremendous um, collaboration from um, uh, our faculty and staff to make uh, sure that students can finish the term because uh, we're talking about the uh, end of March. So uh, what was almost the last month of the term. Uh, now to, to your question is uh, actually we learned from that lesson. The response was quite positive, but uh, um, we have been uh, doing a lot of work during the spring and summer term to make sure that we are ready uh, for uh, fall. And of course, um, we are not um, saying that we don't have challenges. I think each institution has uh, a lot of challenges. Uh, but uh, 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 the most important thing for us is uh, to be creative, try to push boundaries and think out of the box. And I, I see uh, with challenges, opportunities. And uh, we all know that the necessity is a uh, model of innovation, I would say, because we have been pushed by this global crisis uh, to uh, uh, do um, uh, our work to the best possible way to support our students. I have seen some, so many examples of um, very um, creative and innovative um, ideas. And I would say, I'm talking about our own experience at Ryerson University, I think students would really enjoy uh, the new experience or new experiences. Um, talking about online is not just uh, one way of doing it. Uh, we all understand that the need of the professor to connect to students, but I think the engagement of students is extremely important. If we want them to be successful, we need to, to have them engage in the learning uh, process. Uh, I give you just one example. I uh, uh, had a, a, a lengthy conver conversation with our Dean of Science. We know that in science and engineering, we have large components of the learning is happening in the labs. Uh, so, um, uh, and I was amazed by the response of our, uh, uh, our team. Um, most of the labs in the science will be actually using virtual reality, where students can actually do those experiences in chemistry, biology, physics, uh, using new technologies. 
And I mean, uh, I, I have seen some of the examples and I was amazed. I mean, my, my background is in engineering and I would say that that's something that is unique for students to be uh, participating in this learning experience. New learning experiences, a new normal. Uh, but I think we have to uh, always think out of the box and uh, provide students with new ways where they can be part of the learning because learning is not just one way from the instructor or the faculty to students. Learning also has to be between students. And I think the engagement and peer-to-peer -peer learning is extremely powerful. If we can use a platform or technology to give them that way to communicate, but also learn from each other, I think that will be probably a new normal that will add to the experience and also to add to the success of our students. Jennifer, if I can maybe jump in there. I think the president said something that's compelling because it's again been true for a very long time, but as he said, technology actually and rarely could serve as an equalizer here rather than as something that decreases access for so many. And you know, Fazio mentioned Wi-Fi, mentioned devices, et cetera. There's all sorts of reasons why tech could actually make this worse for disadvantaged students or less privileged students. But I think there is also the opportunity for faculty members to take that into consideration and for institutions to take that into consideration and literally reverse it so they're benefiting. And there's a couple specific ways that have been ingrained in pedagogy since way before the internet came around that I think institutions and some were actually created in Canada like problem-based learning at McMaster or Athabasca's new system for accrediting skills and competencies so that people can get credit for what they've already learned or know uh, much more rapidly. Uh, there's a wide variety, you know, flipping classrooms is really basic pedagogy. It doesn't require video or internet, and yet it hasn't been implemented in the vast majority of post-secondaries. And so if we take these basic pedagogical principles and then as the president suggested, Mohammed suggested, imagine how they could be implemented in a creative and in an inclusive manner online, I think you could end up with actually much better educational institutions than we currently have. Alex, uh, since you study and work in this very closely and really know that, that larger landscape, I'm hearing so many concerns from different stakeholders, right? There's the health, which I think we'd all agree is the top concern we keep coming back to, but as well as mental health, which Fazi has, has mentioned, and that, that's also part of health here. Uh, there's uh, the financial aspect for the universities. You mentioned, Alex, for many communities where universities are, are, are based. Now we also have the education, pedagogy, and trends. Uh, Alex, from what you're seeing, are are these conversations alive or are we focusing too much in one area and not, not enough in, in, in the other area? I mean, you highlighted residents being a, a, a top concern that should really be a focus. I'm, I'm curious about um, how we're talking about uh, teaching and, and, and trends that should be embraced. Oh, Alex, just unmute yourself there. I, thank you very much. Um, I think the, uh, it's not so much the public discussion, right? I mean, the public discussion, you've only got, you know, you're, it's like a radar screen. It's about that big, right? And there's actually this much stuff going on. Um, I mean, the part that I've been most impressed by, I think, has been the willingness of staff to, of academic staff to re-engage with pedagogy. And I don't think it's anything specific about, about being online or particular tools or, you know, uh, you know which program to use. I think the the main thing has simply been they're going back to basics and saying how do I can in this in this medium how do I convey the right kind of concepts how do I assess their knowledge it's all different and I think that'll pay huge dividends down the road when we go back to face to face and we are going back to face to face it's just a question of whether it's January or June um, you know they they will have thought a lot more about the basics of their profession much more intensely than they will have probably since you know they got their first uh, uh, faculty job because um, normally you just get into a rut and you think about the you don't have to think about these things that deeply the financial stuff I mean I think it's been very difficult to talk about because we I think everyone has settled on the view that domestic students are going to show up the way they always do um, we just don't know whether the international students are going to show up um, we know they applied in regular numbers or even a little bit higher we know they were accepted you know, the universities offered acceptances and, they, and the students said yes, but we haven't asked them to pay yet, right? So the deadlines for actually putting down the money, and that's what we're waiting for. And no one's really going to know until quite late in August how, how it's going to pay out. It could play out very nastily. I mean, I just, I was noticing the Australian universities are talking about tens of thousands of job cuts. 
uh, from lost income from international students. New Zealand, slightly better shape, but still same kind of thing. Um, the UK is not complaining quite the same way, but they're basically saying, hey, everybody come, which, you know, Canadians just have a lower tolerance for COVID. I think the UK government has basically uh, said it's okay to kill thousands of people to get through this um, this pandemic. And so, sure, bring in people from all over the world. Go ahead. We're not doing that. We've got a different kind of, of, of thing. So I think that's kind of an issue. Um, you know, I think the student, you know, Fozzie, I mean, Fozzie said it very carefully. It's, it's very, it's a tricky question. On the one hand, you want to be with fellow students. You want to be with people who, with whom you can share ideas. You go to university to be social. It's the best On the part. other hand, it's yeah, the best part. yeah, that's right. And uh, I think, and the problem is, is that it's not safe. In most parts of the country, it's not in, well, sorry, I, you know, a PEI is fine. Okay. I, guys, UPI, they're going to have a great term. Um, I, in many parts of the country, it's not safe. I'm, I'm worried about Toronto. It's fantastic. We only had six new cases yesterday. Um, I personally don't believe that'll last after stage three. I think they're going to open the bars and everything's going to go to pot. Um, and, you know, so it's a real, que it's a real uh, question. And I think universities were quick. Again, Canadian universities were quicker than American universities to pick up that students didn't have just one set of concerns. It wasn't just, I want to get back as fast as possible. It's also, wait a minute, this is, this could be dangerous. I need to be protected. And so, you know, I mean, you're seeing institutions respond to it by saying, here's our mask policy and here's the way we're distancing and those kinds of things. But I think fundamentally, I, here's, here's the question that I think is a problem. Everybody is planning for this to be a one-term phenomenon, right? I would say all the hope. public- Alex, that's our big hope. Right? Like that people are projecting their hopes. You can't plan around your hopes. And, they, and this is exactly what you're seeing in U.S. universities right now. They all planned around their hopes. And all these universities said, yeah, we're open. They're saying now, two weeks before students start coming back, uh, we have to, you know, we're going to be online. And people are freaking out, and rightly so. I think institutions we've made good plans for this to be a fall, a reasonable fall session. I think we've got some work to do around engagement. I think I, I do worry about dropouts. That's, that, that to me is the story we're not talking about is what happens if we're not engaging enough and there is large scale dropout in late September, early October. I completely see that problem. Um, but I think in a sense, the bigger problem is we might not be able to be back full speed in January. We might not, be, we might not have international travel by January. We might not have... We, not might be, we might not be able to go back to more than 50% capacity in classes by January. We could be in this straight, straight through to next September. And I don't think that's, um, uh, I, I, I think, you know, the scale of the mental health crisis that will be associated with that is pretty large. I don't think we've planned for that. Um, and I don't think we've planned financially for it. I think, I think the real, most universities have enough money to get through that first term with the loss of, of international student revenue. Second term, it starts to bite. And I think uh, we'll know presumably by about mid-October what the chances look like for January. But um, I'm uh, increasingly pessimistic that this is a one-term, uh, like I said, like you, I hope, I hope it's a one-term thing, but uh, it could get a lot worse if, if we're in the same situation now in January or February. Thank you, Alex. Uh, we have a very active chat. I just want to remind everyone, if you have a question, to go to slido.com. That's S-L-I-D-O.com. And the code to enter is FPR7. And we're going to move to questions right now. And thanks for everyone who, we have a lot of questions. And also, there's uh, been voting, upvoting, and engagement with the questions. Uh, Mark posts, I just released a study showing large income losses for graduates if economy doesn't improve soon. Are institutions thinking about strategies to help students? Uh, Mohammed, do you wanna speak to this one? Yes, um, uh, I would say um, from day one when we uh, experienced the uh, first uh, issues uh, dealing with the pandemic, uh, our focus was really to support our students. As I said, of course, the safety and well-being of students was, and the community uh, was a top priority, but we also uh, paid attention to uh, uh, the uh, uh, pressure on students, especially from the financial point of view. And I can tell you that our reaction was uh, uh, to, um, and I know uh, you, you, Jennifer, you mentioned the uh, 
uh, calls from uh, many students that uh, we, since we are moving to online, uh, the tuition fee uh, should be reduced. But the reality is actually because of uh, all the uh, technology and the requirements, um, uh, the expenses are higher than uh, during regular, uh, uh, regular sessions. So um, we have made it very clear that students who are in need uh, we have to provide them with financial support. Uh, for the first uh, uh, few weeks of the pandemic, we have uh, made available $5 million to students, uh, students who are in need. And then we will continue to do that because we understand that uh, many uh, students are not able to find the jobs, uh, the summer jobs. Uh, many uh, students um, uh, lost opportunities also for uh, uh, paid uh, internship opportunities and so on. So uh, we made it very clear that the term of tuition uh, fee framework will keep it the same. Uh, however, we will focus on helping. Hi, good afternoon. How are you? Our, 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 our need. Very well, thank you. My name is Ornai. Sorry, uh, the, continue. I mean, the, the, the other aspect that we also uh, invested heavily is uh, helping students who have difficulty with access to internet. Uh, when we switched uh, the first days, uh, of course, not all students had access to uh, computers at, at their homes and laptops. We uh, made also uh, uh, available uh, hundreds of laptops for students um, to be used. And also we helped them with access to internet uh, through those uh, uh, hotspot internet, but also we had some of our um, uh, partners, company partners that uh, had also students um, getting uh, access to inter internet for free. So I think uh, that, that that's an important element and we should continue to provide that type of support for students. Thank you so much. Uh, Jake, I'm going to ask this next audience question to you. On the conversation of technologies, what are trainings for cybersecurity and specifically accountability on safety? long-term strategies for going online. So if you could speak to like, not yeah, I'm not an expert in this area, but like the, the larger thinking around it, that'd be great. Of course, I mean, the cybersecurity question is dead on uh, because I know it is a massive issue and it's not just universities, but hospitals and almost all of the public sector and even the private sector are getting hit particularly hard right now by cyber attacks. So I think that is a huge, huge issue. Um, and I think the, one of the challenges, if we are gonna broaden that to the question of how technology gets implemented by institutions that were certainly not at the forefront of the technological um, spectrum recently is, is a really, really good question. The, the roles that keep popping to mind for me uh, to the earlier question, which I thought was fantastic on labor market outcomes, we need way more career developers. And to this question, you know, we need way more people who are career counseling students because they need, they're gonna be asking questions now, even if they're in first year, how does your institution, your college help me get a job? And, and the colleges and universities should have good answers to that. Um, but on the current question in terms of technology, those who are in the teaching and learning departments, again, have been massively underrated over the years. It is remarkable how infrequently faculty members go to their teaching and learning department to ask a question about how to use a given technology. And obviously they've been overwhelmed over the past few months because they've been trying to help every faculty member at every institution. But- I think, Is that a confidence issue? Is that you know, people are overworked and overwhelmed? I think a lot of it comes down to really specific forms of behavioral economics. If I was going to be blunt, I would say laziness. But I mean, I was a faculty member for five years. And when I started, I took my predecessor's curriculum and I tried to integrate as much work integrated learning and problem based learning as possible and ensure that every year the students have a had a syllabus that was relatively up to date. But I changed less and less every year for five years. And I think that is a common trend, like it's a natural human trait. And part of why we build societies and you know, educational institutions is to create the structures that will counter those human trends that have, for instance, a negative impact on education. Uh, and I think one of the biggest challenges is as a society, we haven't figured out how to counter the constantly increasing pace of technology and even some of the implications like a virus that can spread as a result of everybody being on planes all the time. Um, and so once, once you have these new problems, we likely have to literally change the structure both of society and of educational institutions. And I think that's what I'm almost hopeful about 
us doing, not tomorrow, but certainly over the next, as Alex said, year or two. Thanks, Jake. And uh, Mark uh, shared a link in, in chat to the, the earlier question in, in regards to the research. Uh, another question here from Slido. What are the associated fixed and variable cost institutions and how might these affect institutions in the next five years regarding the student experience? Alex, do you want to speak to that? Like, you know, what are the, the costs and how does that, that impact the student experience? And unmute yourself there too. Thanks. Um, so uh, student costs can go down in a pandemic, right? I mean, in the sense, uh, certainly their net costs are going down. They're getting eight, $9 billion in aid from uh, the government of Canada, even if you take the WE money out. Um, you know, Canada had the by far the large, like it's not even close. It was about a hundred times bigger than, well, I'm exaggerating, it's 10 times bigger per capita than any other student rescue package in the world. So between the CESB and the doubling of the student loans and the extra money in Canada student jobs, I, I personally am not worried about the, 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 the affordability argument. Like I actually think this is as affordable a year of school as we've ever had in Canada because there's just that much money floating around. Um, I get the argument that, you know, the, the, the cost argument the students make, which is very much, um, this isn't what I set up. This, you know, this isn't what I signed up for. Why is it costing so much? When you think about how universities spend their money, 70% of it is on staff. How many staff are, are universities laying off? And the answer is not many. I mean, a few. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the fitness centers are not working. But apart from that, and, and you're probably cleaning less often than you would otherwise because most of those buildings are empty. But, you know, all your profs, you still got to pay them. You still got to pay everybody in finance and pay and roll and res all the research, well, maybe not all the research assistants, but some, a lot of the research assistants. Um, so they're not actually saving that much. I mean, in theory, online education is cheaper than in-person education in theory, um, but that's assuming you have no legacy costs, like, you know, uh, you know, an entire campus in the middle of the most expensive city in Canada, like Mohammed has, right? I mean, those are not easy costs to cut. So, um, you know, I think what you're gonna see from institutions, the, the extra costs are when students do come back, the cleaning is gonna be a big deal. Um, the attempt to get extra space in some cases in order to meet, uh, you know, um, spacing requirements is a real deal. I think in some cases you are actually going to have to pay profs to spend longer in classes. That will be less in universities than in colleges. But I just think about, um, uh, it was a great example, George Brown, right? George Brown, they have this fantastic cooking program. And you know how they're, how they're right across the street from it. Yeah. And you know how they're evaluating it? There's no tasting involved. Basically, the, the, the teacher chefs are watching the student chefs uh, video themselves making this stuff so they can see technique. And when it comes out of the oven or whatever, it's, whatever you're doing with it, you can actually see, you can see the presentation. Does it look right? Have they used the right steps? So they're, they're evaluating process rather than you know, the taste, which is sort of the end result. But you do that one by one, that's a lot harder to do than it is walking around the internal, you know, the inside of one of those chef's kitchens, which is 16, 20 people working at the same time. It takes you three or four times as long to do it. In a drama class, same thing, right? Like what's the, what can you do in a drama? There are drama classes going on across the country. But there's a lot of that kind of stuff where human movement is an issue that is just going to take so much more to actually get done in an online environment. And that's mostly where your costs are, I would think. It's, it's going to be those, those kind of human costs. It's going to be hiring a lot more, and I haven't heard what everybody's doing about this, but I think it's about hiring a lot more TAs for those very big classes so that, um, you know, it's, you know the, the, those 500 person first year classes, you make sure that a couple times a week, you've got a group of 10 or a group of 15 that you can deal with, which, you know, I think it's a bigger deal now than it is in, in, in normal times. So again, it's, it's, there are extra human costs in running this. People are going to be spending a lot more on licensing for online uh, products and, 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 and um, you know, simulations and that kind of stuff. I mean, on the whole, look, it, does it, is it more than 5% of their annual budget, like extra? No, probably not. That's probably the thing. But at the same time, you've got institutions that have got 5 10% of their income at risk for losing, um, international students. So you're talking about some institutions that are going, wow, I could be down 10% on where I was last year, right? I had maybe, I, I, maybe my margin last year was 2%, 3%. This year it's going to be minus seven. 
And if I lose the second term, it's going to be minus 15. And that's where you start getting into the, uh, you see institutions could close kind of thing. And it's not, I don't think it's a big deal with universities. I do think there are some Ontario colleges that are in real trouble because they are so reliant on international student fees. And many of them have got healthy balance sheets that will get them through one year. There's a few that don't. And that's where the, that's where the danger is going to be. If you go to two, two terms out, there are institutions that will go to the wall. Yeah, this is another thing that I, I see as a positive, which is as a culture at large, we're all paying more attention to budgets in every aspect mm -hmm. of our lives. So there is a transparency piece in, in learning to understanding where our, where our money goes, uh, especially as we look at our own money and you know what we have or, or mm -hmm. don't have or how we want to spend it. Yeah. Uh, Mohammed, and and Canada has a very expensive system of higher education and it gives us good results by and large. But we all may end up in a situation that Alberta, you know, effectively put itself in in the fall and in the early spring and saying, maybe we don't want a Volvo anymore. Maybe we want a Honda. And, uh, you know, that would be difficult in Ontario because Ontario is already, you know, by far the worst funded system, publicly funded system. That's why the tuition fees are so high uh, in Canada. So it's, a, it's difficult there. But I do think, yeah, the real issue, the, in a sense, some of the longer term financial issues may be governments saying, we can't afford this anymore. Like there's so many other priorities post COVID. Um, you know, people are going to be interested in universal basic incomes and people are going to be interested in strengthening the health system. And I'm not sure that we're going to keep, sp we spend public money. We spend as much money as Germany or France does. And to make it a little education. more pointed, yeah. people are going to be asking about skills and jobs and not yeah. about every other aspect. And the elite, I think will yeah. still want the full liberal arts science education in person with a brand that is extraordinarily recognized around the world yeah. but only the elite will be able to afford that and 10 years from now online will actually be the equalizer hopefully for those who can't afford that in-person access because things like pandemics have made it much more expensive to be in person yeah and we've already seen some early signs of that that jake or, or at least analysis around it uh, the next question is about Ryerson, so I'm going to direct this to you, uh, Mohammed, and we'll be getting some uh, votes up, up, ups and downs here, so just move a little bit, one, one second. Uh, hi there, what are the racial injustices that would be addressed specifically moving forward in Ryerson, and what are the tangible plans for this? The example is online programs. Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I mean, uh, Ryerson, we uh, do have um, a very diverse community. Uh, I mean, it's a, a really a reflection of uh, representation of, uh, of 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 Toronto, and uh, that's what I mentioned when you move uh, most of the offering to online. Um, we have people who are behind or left behind because they don't necessarily have access uh, to um, internet. Uh, but also we are hearing from a lot of students that they don't necessarily have quite space uh, to study, even if uh, everything is virtual or online. Uh, they don't necessarily have enough space at home to be able to, uh, to, to concentrate and focus on their studies. And um, one of the things that we, we are doing to address this, um, I would say 99% of our courses will be online, but we want to also to make sure that uh, we offer uh, study space for uh, students on campus. And we do also have a, a huge demand for residents. I know that um, Alex mentioned something very important. We have to make sure that uh, we have the proper uh, process in residences, but a lot of students are uh, willing to come to residences to make sure that they have also access to technology, access to uh, uh, study space. And in this case, we have to pay attention. I agree with, uh, with Alex in terms of the transmission of the virus. And uh, we have, in this case, to operate uh, those residences at uh, low capacity compared to, uh, to uh, regular, uh, uh, regular days. And in this case, what uh, Alex mentioned in terms of uh, uh, cost or uh, uh, effect on, uh, on, on budget, I would say one element that Alex actually mentioned many elements that are really affecting our uh, uh, operations. And I'm talking about all, most of the universities. Uh, one aspect is I mean, many, uh, uh, many universities have uh, capacity in residences and many universities are still paying mortgages on those residences because government will not fund universities uh, in terms of uh, 
housing and residences for, for students. Uh, but when they're empty in terms of, uh, of uh, less, uh, uh, less revenue for university, this also will affect the bottom line of the budget. So I just want to make sure that that's another aspect where um, if you have capacity for 2,000, 3,000 3, or more um, students in residence, and then you operate at uh, 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 reduced capacity, uh, this also will affect your, uh, your budget uh, situation. But uh, I think in terms of uh, uh, making sure that the equity and the inclusion is part of it, you have to pay attention to students who are not necessarily having uh, access to, uh, uh, to education the way that students who, uh, who are wealthy uh, are. And specifically, how is Ryerson's anti-racism work factoring into this discussion and adjusting to online? I mean, we, uh, we, we, we actually, uh, uh, we know that uh, uh, in addition to the, uh, to the pandemic, um, the society, uh, overall societies over the world are dealing with the issue of racism and so on. Um, we have done actually uh, last year um, a, a lot of engagement, uh, especially in terms of um, black anti-racism uh, and, and then also racism against uh, uh, indigenous people. And then uh, we have done a lot of consultation and we just published this uh, month uh, our report. And then uh, one of the ways that we did this is also doing it in, on, in a virtual environment, engaging people, but also uh, we are uh, putting an implementation plan to address the issues of uh, anti-racism, uh, given what's happening in, in the US and the rest of the world. Thanks, Mohamed. We're about to move to break our room shortly, but uh, Fazia, since you ran on a platform of anti-discrimination and anti-racism, curious to uh, hear some of the plans and conversations you're having with students and in the Students' Union. Sure. This kind of opens up a lot. There's been a lot of um, conversations, uh, specifically over the last few weeks, um, so I'm trying to wrap my mind on like where to start. Um, something that was really big on our campus um, over the last few weeks and I think really blossomed into a lot of conversation as to next steps moving into the year um, and just reevaluating um, a lot of various aspects of our campus. Um, we had a lot of conversations around policing in the community and policing on our campus. Um, so as a student union, we've moved forward to publish our stance on um, campus and community policing um, and how we hope for our um, municipal City Council to um, move forward with defunding as well as our um, university as well um, because this is something that many students have asked for um, like my entire inbox the entire inbox of all of the executives at our students union was filled with students who um, came forward and wanted to discuss their feelings on policing their feelings around safety and policing in the community and also on campus um, so that's something that um, I think really ties in well with anti-racism because you know policing does disproportionately affect um, students of color um, so this is something that we really wanted to prioritize for the year, um, but also moving into, I guess, academia and also just, um, I guess, our campus as a whole, something that we've wanted to work, wanted to work on um, academic wise is um, pushing for decolonization within various courses. Um, just, I guess, really recentering the forms of knowledge that take place in academia, um, especially because McMaster really does like to pride itself on its academics and we think that's something that um, really can move it forward is decolonizing various syllabuses um, within the social sciences and within the humanities, but also in the engineering and the sciences, um, even if that's through language and like course competencies. Um, there's just a lot of movement that can be done in academia. Um, so that's something that we would really like to push for as well as really working with our university with um, We have various, um, I guess, like bodies that had anti racism at our university. So we have um, like an equity, diversity and inclusion steering committee. Um, we have a race, racialization, and religion um, working group. And there's a lot of great work that's being done by a lot of folks there. Um, so just really making sure that students are engaged in all the anti-racism conversations. Um, students are engaged in any review processes that we're bringing forward, um, as well as really ensuring that we have programming that's active um, and actively engaging students of color, actively um, ensuring that there's change at the university admin level. Um, but Great, thank you so much. It's now time for us to move into the breakout rooms. And I like this because this is where we can have focused conversations in smaller groups. So I'm gonna hand it back to the first policy response team. And after the breakout rooms, we're gonna come back together as a larger group uh, to hear about some of the conversations. Great, so you'll be, uh, you have the chance to join a breakout room now. So just click on that link and then we'll uh, come back in plenary uh, 
around 623, 625.
I like this part where I look at the participants icon in the navigation below and you just see everyone popping up. I mean, while we can't meet in person, there's an excitement in this. Hi, Alex. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, um, Jen and everybody. We're gonna do some quick uh, breakout room reports back, I believe. Um, so perhaps uh, I'll get started um, with the uh, breakout room with Mohammed Lashmi, uh, Helen Tewald from, uh, formerly from the um, uh, Higher Qu Education Quality Council, now with uh, uh, the Law Society, put I think a very useful and necessary question to us around uh, to, to, to the room as a whole, and we had a number of responses. Uh, she was concerned about risk mitigation and what is the, what is the, the biggest thing that's keeping you up at night. Um, something in, in Senate, you'll see some other published responses on our first policy response website later in the week. Um, and we had a number of interventions on that focused on a concern around the diminution of the lived, of the educational experience for students and a concern about um, fatigue, burnout, and mental health challenges for all players in the system, um, for all people in the system, students, uh, staff, faculty, and uh, a group that doesn't get mentioned often enough, uh, sessional instructors. And that was, the, uh, that was the flavor of our conversation in our breakout. Uh, I can go next. Uh, we were, I was with Alex. Um, maybe three main themes. One was um, about the financial viability of institutions if they are pushed into winter. Uh, and Alex made the point that they survived both world wars and while the experience may change that uh, likely the institutions themselves will survive. A uh, really rich, good discussion about uh, marginalized students, vulnerable students, students with dependents, uh, indigenous remote uh, students, and um, the challenges that this uh, pandemic is um, is not purely financial, that there's lots of reasons why we may lose some students and that the student body may become less representative of Canada and what to do about that. Um, and then we had a quick discussion about the research mission of institutions, of universities in particular, and um, its role right now in uh, this kind of time where the teaching mission is, is front and center. Um, so really great discussion. Caleb, do you want to go next? Yeah, of course. Thank you so much. Um, in our breakout group, we started off by saying that we've been, from our whole discussion so far, we've been talking too much about identifying the problems and not enough on working towards a solution. So our conversation was more solution-based. We started off with Craig when he was saying that the biggest concern to him as a recent graduate is that it's a career, career transition. How is the university going to facilitate policies on how to transit to a better career or transit from your bachelor's degree to your master's or for high school students towards university. That's a big concern, but having a solid policy on that. Continuing, um, Kelly Castle was commenting on student compliance with health regulations. She said that, as we can see, the circumstances of how students will understand the severity of what the pandemic is could do to our student life and how that affects our peer-to-peer -peer connection is very, obviously very drastic too because if we're over there and we let everyone back into residence or residence open to a partial amount of students, but no one's complying to the regulations, what's really the point? We're going back to square one. And uh, over here we have um, Novina Robinson commented on changing the fundamental of academic life, like changing the academic calendar, whether we still have to do September to January, whether we could amend that so it could be compliant to the new waves of the pandemic or the situation that we're in right now. And um, we ran out of time near the end, but we still had um, one student teacher, uh, Michael, comment on different transitions for teachers that were teaching high school, elementary schools that want to teach university post-secondary education institutions. And also um, we had comments from Andrew, who works in the rural universities, that talked about focusing on student confidence. Um, throughout the whole conversation, we talked about how students have a big sense of insecurity right now. And me, even graduating recently, I do have a big sense of insecurity on what to do next. What kind of policies are gonna guarantee me to regain my confidence in, that, in my academic journey? So that's just like the big summary that I have written down over here. Thank you so much, Caleb. And we'll hand it over to Stephanie. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, we had a very lively conversation as well. Um, <clears throat> a, few, uh, a few interesting points that came up. Um, one is we had a uh, professor, and, and, sorry, 
don't have your name on hand. We had a professor from uh, Laurier who was speaking about uh, how she'd been an instruct working as an instructor over the summer and already seeing problems with student engagement where you'd have like a, a wall of, uh, of black screens from, uh, from students who weren't, uh, weren't engaging and weren't you know, turning on their computers and asking questions or turning on their, their cameras and asking questions during classes. So uh, we spoke a little bit about how students can, can stay involved and, and feel like they are part of a, a community and how to engage with their classes and not just uh, check out and, uh, you know, turn their laptops off and just, you know, not pay attention. So um, that's something that uh, I, I think, you know, we said that students and instructors will have to work through as they, they adjust to this new world. Um, another question on the, the, the topic of, uh, you know, trying to maintain student life when you're not able to, to be on campus and, and see your, your classmates and your friends. Um, Fazia spoke about how student unions are, are trying to be creative and thinking of things like you know, virtual sports and, and activities like that. She said, you know, it, it might feel a little bit silly at first, but they're really thinking of ways that you can maintain student life outside of just uh, specific academia um, and have outlets for, for students that aren't just related to their classes and their education. Um, and finally, we had an excellent question about um, how uh, especially remote learning will affect uh, neurodiverse uh, students and students with disabilities. And that's something that um, I, I know a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, universities are aware of. Um, you know, Fazia mentioned that they've been using Microsoft Teams, which does allow closed captioning, and they have software that allows this. Um, but this is something that, again, um, you know, this, you know, both the university uh, and student union uh, are working on right now to try to make sure that um, all the students are able to access as much of their education as they can during these, uh, these times so that are outside of the ordinary. Thank you, Stephanie. And before we hand it back to first policy response, if I could ask everyone, if you look at your navigation, there's reactions. If you could pull out the applause, I'd like to give a round of applause to all of our moderators of the breakout rooms, Kareem, Sam, Caleb, and Stephanie, as well as our panelists, Jake, Fazia, Mohammed, and Alex. And first policy response, thank you so much for bringing us together. It's very meta to be doing online learning together tonight as we talk about online learning, but you know, that's, that's the moment in, in opportunity. So handing it back to the team. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jen. And please stay for these closing credits as the music starts to swell. Uh, thanks for joining this conversation. Thanks to you at the Walrus, uh, Jennifer Hollett. I think you've set a pretty high bar for future moderator uh, work. Um, thanks to the Public Policy Forum at Greenspawn, Victoria Kukets, uh, Katie Davey, and Andre Lucas for partnering on this event. Um, thank you to our guests, Fazia Ali, Jake Hirsch Allen, Mohammed Lashmi, and Alex Usher. Um, you can continue to follow this conversation by uh, reading the Policymakers Recovery Agenda for Higher Education, which was co published by the Public Policy Forum and First Policy Response. You can also read a shorter series of exclusive pieces just for First Policy Response on colleges and universities response to the pandemic and some of the policy challenges that we'll be publishing uh, through first policy response in the coming days. Please feel free to stay in touch with us on uh, Twitter, uh, policy response or policy response at ryerson.ca with any further questions or feedback. We're accepting uh, submissions and pitches. You don't have to be a, uh, an established policy expert. We, and we have a contributors fund for honorariums to, so, uh, to support voices traditionally underrepresented in the policy space. Thanks again to the Walrus and the Public Policy Forum. You've laid in a, um, this group uh, and this conversation has laid bare uh, the challenges and some of the energy uh, that is going into this incredibly uh, complicated public policy challenge um, um, and something that is uh, really gonna be integral uh, to our recovery, uh, no matter how long that recovery takes. I uh, really appreciate your participation. Thank you um, for joining and for taking part and joining us today.